good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rat Pack. I'm Anthony Luskery, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango. Tonight's topic is Introduction to Amateur Radio Contesting. And just to give you an idea on my cover slide here, this is not my station. This is about 50 miles east of me, right over the uh, Ohio-Pennsylvania line. This is K3LR's uh, contest station, a perennial winner in the worldwide multi-op contesting. And this is Tim Duffy, the owner of the station. Tonight's presentation, the slides are available at tiny.cc slash AR contest. Again, tiny.cc slash AR contest. I'll also put this up at the end. You can scan the barcode. Uh, you're going to want this so you can click on the links that are in the presentation. The links are done in a serifed italicized font, and you'll often see a little uh, link symbol at the end of them. So what is amateur radio contesting? Contesting, also known as radio sport, is a competitive activity pursued by amateur radio operators. Winning is based on the highest total score in a given period of time. And most contest act contests actually have multiple winners because there's multiple categories. So the beginning of contesting probably dates back to the 20s when the uh, AWRL put on an activity called the Transatlantic Test, and the idea was to see if uh, hams in the U.S. could work across the Atlantic to Europe. And you'll notice here on the cover of QST of January 22, that's 19, that's 1922, they had listed both Spark stations and CW. So it gives you an idea of the time frame. It's was Spark was just starting to go away and CW was taking over, but it had not completely taken over yet. So after they ran this, this challenge, a lot of people said, well, this was fun doing this type of activity. Let's do some other things like that. So contests were formed to provide opportunities for amateur radio operators to practice their mes message handling skills. They were used for routine or long distance emergency communication. They used for routine or long distance emergency communication. Remember the very name ARRL stands for amateur um, radio relay leg oh that station just popped i just worked in fo0 i mean fo5 on uh wsjtx in the background so the awr was uh the american radio relay leg and the idea was most people couldn't talk very far so they needed to relay states the messages through multiple stations and contesting was a great way to uh, practice the skill over time, the number and variety of contests greatly increased. Each has its own specific rules, dates, frequencies, and character. Today, many operators pursue the sport as their primary amateur radio activity. Contesting is a popular activity in amateur radio, but just like amateur radio itself, it's multifaceted with different meanings and activities for individual operators. Today, we're going to talk about breaking it down into two main categories, what I'm going to refer to as competitive contesting and non-competitive contesting. And that might seem like an oxymoron. You're saying, how can you contest if it's not competitive? What I'm going to talk about is how you can use contest as an operating tool, even if you're not interested in the competition aspect of it. So let's talk about competitive contesting first. This is winning your category, placing high in the scores, exceeding your personal previous best, meeting personal goals for the contest, or the best score, score within your group of, or friends, radio club, etc. And this little printout here on the right is the top 10 uh, for U.S. and Canada scores. Uh, CQ Magazine, when they do their top 10s and top 5s, traditionally print it in a yellow background. So my wife would come in and ask me how I was doing in a contest, and I would tell her I'm in the yellow box, and she knew that I was doing pretty well. I expected I would finish in the top five or ten in my category. Here's a trophy I won. Uh, there's actually four of these CQ Worldwide trophies on the wall here. Um, my category is QRP, single band, or multi-band, uh, all band, I should say, in this particular case. And uh, so this is the competitive aspect of things, trying to win your category or place high. The non-competitive end of things, where winning is not the goal, is to do things like increase your DXCC count, uh, work on awards such as DXCC, worked all states, worked all continents, U.S. counties, etc. The whole idea being that there's a plethora of stations available to work, and they may be in the spot you need to complete an award. Another thing that you can do, non-competitive contesting, is test out your station, its antennas, its equipment, explore new bands and modes 
Uh, for example, if you've never operated 160 before, a great time when there's a lot of activity is during one of the three 160 only or three or four 160 only contests that take place during the winter time. It's a great time when there's a lot of people on the band and you can really try out 160. Another aspect of non-competitive contesting is it's a great training place for emergency operations. Uh, being able to copy in detail uh, the exchange is very similar to copying that important emergency message. It improves your message handling skills. If you're operating CW, you can build your CW skills and speed. And probably one of the, the, the most fun aspects of it is just a fun way to have uh, a way to have fun working a lot of stations in a very short time period. And this is my friend Jim, WA3JAT. This He's not really working a contest per se, he's working field day, but you can see that excitement on his face because he worked over 700 stations himself on 40 meters this last year. So if you're not competitive, why would you choose contest to get on the air? Well, there's a couple reasons. For one, that's a great chance to work uh, rare locations. There's a high activity level with a higher density of stations on multiple bands. Some locations are only only on during contest. Some of the best stations with the best operators and receiving antennas are listening for you. So even your weak, weak signals can get worked. It's a great place to hone your copying skills, unfamiliar call signs, polyps, weak stations, etc. A great place to work in your grid, states, countries, etc., and maybe even get a new DXCC country. Even technician licensees can join in the fun. 10 meters has been open the last couple of weeks. Uh, this last weekend in the uh, RIDI contest, the CQ Worldwide RIDI, I got on 10 meters for a little while in the afternoon and worked a bunch of Pacific uh, stations, a bunch of the islands. And that's something that a, 10 meter, a technician class operator could have done on that particular band. Other reasons, one of the big ones is other stations want to work you. So you're not just every, uh, a station calling CQ, you're potential points for them. So they really want to work you. Other hams appreciate the contacts you provide, especially if you're a multiplier in their contest. Something like a state QSO party activating your county, you may be the only person activating your particular county. So you become a rare multiplier. Before jumping in, though, make sure you know your exchange, and I have a whole uh, link here on information on the exchange that you can click on. I also have a slide here, and I want to talk about what the exchange is and what you need to know. First of all, the exchange is the information you give in addition to your call sign. So it might be a signal report, but more often it's one of these many different types of pieces of information. Again, going back to that whole history of practice for um, relaying messages the exchange is a way to have that information go out and uh, practice that one type of exchange might be your name feel free to use a name other than your given name or a nickname etc i don't know use anthony because it's way too long in cw it's hard to uh, understand on phone and i don't really answer to tony it just doesn't ring a bell for me so when i'm contesting i use my short name which is actually my initials a l which happens to be a valid first name, Al. So it's very quick and easy to send, much shorter than Anthony. Uh, they might ask you for an SPC. That would be either your state, your Canadian province, or if you're outside of North America, your country. Uh, it might be an AWRL, uh, RAC section. And these are slightly different from uh, the states because some of the states like Ohio only have one section in them, but other states like California have multiple sections and if we take a quick look at one of these links this is a map <coughs> excuse me of the sections and you can see how many are in california ontario has four sections um even even pennsylvania right next to me has uh two sections in it uh grid squares are very common and i have a link to find out information on your grid square when you go to out to this resource here some contests use a serial number in other words after each contact, you increment up one, so your first contact would be one, your second contact would be two, etc., etc. 
quite often when people are sending serial numbers with CW, they do a couple little shortcuts and a couple little tricks. I'll talk about the shortcuts a little bit later, but one of the tricks they often do is if it's a single digit, they might precede it with a T. So T, T, 2 uh, for, uh, this, for your second and then TT3, simply so people know that they're not missing part of the, the number, that that's the full number you're sending, especially if it's late in the contest and everyone's serial numbers is up in the hundreds or thousands and you just jump in and give them a one, they might be worrying whether it was really 1,001. Your age is another uh, exchange in some contests. Uh, some contests use the year of your first license as a ham, usually the last two digits, so I would be 81 in that case because I got my license in... July of 1981. Some state, some contests use power output, and it's different ways of expressing it. Sometimes it's just approximate number of watts, uh, so they'll give that, and it might be five watts or 100 watts or a thousand. <laughs> That's the most common, but some people might give a different number. Just I don't know for being unique. So there's one station that always sends five nine 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 for 99 watts. Other contests let you just have you give a category like high power, low power, or QRP, or they might have abbreviations like A class, B class, or Q class. Um, CQ zones are very common, uh, commonly used for two big contests during the year, actually more than two, uh, about five big contests during the year, sponsored by CQ Magazine. The CQ zones, here's the descriptions of each of the zones out there. And then there's also maps available, and I have the map here, and I'll bring up some of the maps here in a moment. Let me just do that real quick. So I have a whole presentation with uh, charts and maps in it that you can access. And here's an example of the CQ uh, zones. So they're just arbitrary drawn zones around the world. There's 40 of them, and uh, North America is comprised of one, two, three, four, five, and six would be North America. Europe is comprised of 14, 15, and 16, so forth. So you're giving that as your number. So you're going to need to be able to look that up on a map ahead of time to know what your exchange would be. Um, then if you're doing something like a park activation, a, a summit activation, an island activation. You need to know the park number, the summit number, or the island on the air number. Sometimes for a uh, club sponsor contest, and they'll exchange a number. So for example, FOC, uh, the SKCC, uh, the QRPARCI group, all give numbers out to their members and they exchange those during contests. And then the, fat, the, the last one on this list is category. So it might be like mobile, rover, home, fixed, uh, this is very common during field day when you're used to giving the number of stations you're 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 uh, transmitting at the same time and a designator so different types of categories <coughs> in addition some contests provide combine more than one of these so they might combine for example the serial number uh the awrl section and the first year license like they do for the awrl sweepstakes in november we'll talk more about exchanges a little bit later some other reasons for non-competitive contesting, it allows you to evaluate your station's performance, experience and learn propagation effects, and you can choose how much time you want to spend. You can spend an hour or you can spend the whole contest. Go full time with butt in the chair. That's what BIC stands for. The more butt in the chair time you have, the more competitive your entry in the contest would typically be. Um, and you can send it a log if you want, or if you don't want to, if you're not worried about the competitiveness, you don't have to. Just let me warn you that I've one time worked, had uh, a Sunday afternoon to kill in Albuquerque. I was at a hotel with just my FT8 and the rubber duck. It was the VHF UHF contest. I went out on the balcony, used some of the balcony and downsprouts as reflectors and directors, and worked a number of states on six meters, sent in my log, and I ended up getting first place uh, QRP category in the New Mexico section. So you might want to turn in a log because you might get an award. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about amateur radio contesting, it's different than a lot of other sports, in that you get to pick your own playing field. In other words, you can choose the type of contest, the type of activities you want to participate, and how you want to participate in them. Uh, what, cate what, what uh, categories you want to enter a specific contest, what power level. 
uh, what band you want to operate. So you actually get to adjust your own playing field. And you can do that based on your interest and in, in, in different modes. So if you're a CW operator, you might want to enter a CW contest. If you're a phone operator, you might not want to stress that. Uh, you might like to do both. Um, depending on what your operating skills are like, you might be able to sit there and uh, work all the different bands, or maybe you just want to limit it to working a short time on one band. Uh, the radio equipment and antennas you have may determine which contest you want to participate in, and again, how much level of competition you want to put into it. You can also choose contests that favor your geographic location. For example, being in the middle of the country is great if it's a contest that involves working U.S. states, um, whereas being on the East Coast is great for working European contests. Being on the West Coast is work great for working Asian contests. Um, you might use it the way to increase your DXCC, worked all states totals, and you might want to consider winning and getting in first place. Now, when you're picking the contest, just like in a sporting days event in olden days, you need a program to know the game's players. In amateur radio contesting, you need a calendar to know the playing field. So there's different co contests throughout the year, and there's a number of different calendars available. Each of these is a link. The one that I like a lot is the WA7BNM contest calendar by Bruce Horn. It's a very, very thorough one. It's probably the most thorough one out there. I also like the DL2NBY calendar because it is a series of Google calendars that you can add to your own Google calendar. So you can actually import it into your own calendar and see it on your calendar instead of having to go out to the site. The AWRO has an extensive contest calendar, and they also have an article that they do in the magazine, and they have on their webpage called Contest Corral. Uh, so there's information on different contests. Here's Bruce Horn. Uh, he also runs another site called the 3830 site, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But this is a presentation that Bruce did to the Rat Pack group a couple weeks ago on uh, the WA7 calendar and the 3830 site. So by clicking on this link, you can go out and watch Bruce's presentation from a few weeks ago. Some contest picks for newbies. A lot of people get their first contesting type of activity. It's not truly a contest, but it's their first contesting activity at AWRL Field Day in June. State QSO parties are a great place to uh, get started. They're much more laid back than some of the big contests, and there is quite a few of them. There's 38 of them throughout the year uh, available uh, to you. We're coming up on the end of the state QSO party challenge. Uh, most of the parties run between February and October. This weekend, Saturday and Sunday, is the biggest state QSO party of the year, though. It's the California QSO party. So if you want to jump into a contest and you know what state you're in, oh, that's the exchange. You just have to give them your exchange, unless you're in California, and then you'll need to know what county you're in. There's VHF and UHF contests, which are great for technicians and anyone else, but they're great places for technicians. There's also very short one-hour contests during the week. These are weekday contests, so they don't type your weekend. There's a phone fray on Tuesday night, which is a single sideband contest. The CW ops have the mini CW test. There's three separate one-hour contests during the day on Wednesdays. The K1 USN on Friday night and Sundays is a slow speed net. And there's a new one, a medium speed net that's just been started by the Long Island CW group, which I don't have in this list. And then there's also a RIDIOPS uh, Thursday night sprint. So these are quick ways to just jump into a contest for about an hour. Here's a list of state QSO parties in the months that they fall in. Some of the contest picks for DXers are the CQ Worldwide DX, probably the biggest contest. Uh, there's two of the versions of it. Well, there's three versions of it. The Riddy contest was last weekend, so you just missed that. The phone contest is the last full weekend in October, and the uh, CW contest uh, is the uh, last full weekend in November. So those are three of the biggest contests. Uh, the AWRO International DX contests take place in early winter. Uh, uh, in January and February. Uh, worked All Europe's take place during the summertime for the most part. Uh, the Russian DX contest, uh, the RSGB IOTA contest, Islands on the Air, and the All Asian DX contest are great places to increase your DXCC totals. Um, there's actually a presentation by Bill, AJ8B, that he did for the QSO Today Virtual Expo back in March. Uh, called Chasing DX During a Contest, and he talks a lot about not be trying to be competitive in the contest, but trying to be a DXer and work more DX entities. 
VHF UHF contesting is very similar to HF contesting with quick exchanges, points per contact, and multipliers. The multipliers in a, v, in a VHF UHF uh, contest are typically grid squares, and with the microwave contest, they're grid squares out to the sixth digit. And I have a link here that help you find your grid square. You can go out here, punch in your information you need. It talks, talks first about what grid squares are. Uh, and then you can go and put your information in and find out what grid square you're in uh, in the U.S. Here's a map of grid squares in the U.S. And you can use this map also if you want to find your grid square. But I suggest you just punch your address in on this uh, couple of these links on here and use one of these tools to find your uh, grid square. By the way, even if you're operating in other activities such as uh, state QSO parties where you need the county or you're doing POTA or SOTA, I strongly suggest you find out what your grid square is going to be because someone might ask you what your grid square is. Also, if you're doing a POTA or SOTA operation, make sure you know what county you're in. So if a county hunter wants to know what county you're in. So there's a variety of modes of operation available during CW, uh, VHF, UHF contests, just as there are in HF, but there is no ready. Uh, their single sideband is the predominant mode with a little bit of CW, but recently we've been getting a lot of FT8 and FT4, and there is still a little bit of FM activity out there, FM simplex. So even if you just have an HT, you might be able to make some contacts. One of the biggest differences with VHF contesting versus HF contesting is this whole idea of QSYing. It's very common on VHF, UHF contests. Let's say I contact the station on six meters. We exchange our grid squares, and then he asked me, what other bands do you have? And I might tell him I have two meters and 430. And then he would say, can you QSY to two meters at 144.220? And I'll say, yes, I'll QSY there. We go up and make a contact there. Then he'll ask me to QSY to 430. He'll give me a frequency, and we'll make a contact there. So it's a great way to test out these higher bands. And the nice thing is, if you work from the bottom up, if you QSY from the bottom up, you can tweak your antenna and get it even better and better. Because when you start getting up into the real high frequencies, the bandwidth is, of your antenna is very narrow. Uh, so the angle, you need to make sure it's aimed exactly. So typically people start at six meters and work their way up, but there's nothing that says you can't work your way down. Uh, the major VHF, UHF contests are for them, uh, the January, June, and September AWRL, and then the July CQ Worldwide. But there are a number of other activities and contests throughout the year, and here's a link to a VHF, UHF con contest calendar. <coughs> There's a number of myths about contesting. Now let's uh, go ahead and debunk some of those right now. Potential and beginner contesters may inquire, encounter a number of myths about contesting. Some people say it's all about the equipment. Um, you might say that my HF antenna is not good, new enough for contesting. Um, you need an amplifier to contest. You need a tower and beam to contest. None of these, these are all absolutely myths. The truth is, even simpler, older radios can still make contacts. It's not the equipment, it's how you use the equipment. Uh, read the manuals, watch videos, so you know how to effectively and efficiently operate all of your equipment. Actually, if I was given the choice of having a brand new radio that I did not know how to operate very well, or a rather old radio that I did know how to operate very well, I think I'd be much more successful with the old radio that I know how to operate well. So make sure before the contest you know how to operate your radio. Uh, contests have separate categories, so you don't need to have an amplifier. Matter of fact, if you have an amplifier, it'll push you into one specific category. But most contests have a QRP level, a low power, which is 100 watts or less, and then they have a a uh, high power, which is up to 1,500 watts. So you're not competing against people with other power levels. You're only competing with people operating the same power level as you. Now, good antennas always help, but are not a panacea. A simple dike pole can make lots of contacts. Again, uh, your operating technique, your location, etc., may have more influence than your antennas. Some other myths. New operators cannot win contests. There's way too much to learn. And if I don't finish in first place, there's no benefit for me in contesting. Well, these myths are definitely myths also. With so many contests and categories available, even newbies can finish first in their category or place at least in the top 10. There are a lot of resources for new contesters to learn more, and you don't need to know it all to get started. Get started, and then you'll learn as you go along. 
Many operators enter contests just to pursue awards, improve skills, or just to have fun so you don't have to win to have a benefit from the contest. But I really want to stress the fact that if you pick the right category in a less than uh, if you piss in one of the less popular contests, you do have a chance of actually winning your category. Here's my station I'm sitting in front of right now. Uh, not not that fancy. Outside I have I do have a tower with a 50, 50 foot tower with a beam on it, which is nice. But I operate all five watts, so I'm always operating in the QRP category if there is one. So there's four basic things you need to operate in a contest. You need a radio and an antenna. You need some basic operating skills. You need to have a list of when the contests are going to be on so you know when the contest date is and you know what the rules are for that particular contest. And fourth, you need a way to log your contacts. Although you could use a paper log, most uh, contests prefer that you use a computer-based log, and computer-based logging is definitely the preferred way to go if you want to be serious about the contest. You need to rule, read the rules before the specific contest. So this is why it's important to look them up on the contest calendar. Know the date and times when you can operate, the bands. And for contests like the, the smaller contests like the state QSO parties, they often suggest specific frequencies within the band. So you're not looking over the band trying to find contacts. And then you also need to know who you can work. So for example, in the DX, DX context like the CQ Worldwide, I can only get uh, points for working states stations outside of my country so i'm not calling for domestic stations i need to work dx stations if it's a state qso party for example in nevada if i'm in nevada i can work anyone but if i'm outside of nevada i have to only work nevada stations uh, you also need to know how scoring works exchange and multipliers again if you're interested in, comp in competing but if you're not you don't even have to worry about that as i said earlier know your exchange ahead of time have your station ready both your radios and antennas, your logging software or paper logging sheets ready to go. So you need to read through the rules and know all this information ahead of time if you want to be successful. Now paper logs for both general and contesting were the norm before the use of computers. And contesters, as a matter of fact, were one of the biggest forces in spurring the development of software for logging because they wanted to do it fast, efficient, and in a very reproducible way. So they actually drove that. Uh, computers with contesting logging software interface with your radio is the way to go if you're really interested and uh, possibly even have a second monitor for more screen space. This particular program here is N1MM Logger Plus. Uh, this is the program I run. It's a free program. Matter of fact, here's some of the logging software for contesting N1MM. And again, you can click on each of these icons to go out to the information on that software. Uh, NN1MM was the, um, is the most popular software. Probably the second is N3 F FJP, a commercial software, but not that expensive. I also have more contesting logging software for Linux and Macintosh and other sources on my website. So if you click on this link and go to the contesting log. I've also done a number of presentations on logging. I have one called uh, Logging Software, both general and contesting. And you can click on this link to view that presentation. It's also been recorded a couple times, so you can also find a recording of it. <coughs> when you're ready to start working stations, there's really two modes of operating. The one way you can make contest contacts is by calling CQ. This is also known as running because you run through stations over and over again. You keep calling CQ and then you work the next station, CQ and work the next station, et cetera, et cetera. Now, most beginners when they start out actually use the technique of answering a CQ, this is often known as search and pounce or hunt and pounce, sometimes abbreviated as S and P. And this is usually the method most beginners use because they're not overwhelmed by a bunch of stations answering their CQ and they can search for stations, especially if you're doing it to try and work new DX or do something else like that. Search and pounce might be the way to go. But eventually, if you really want to work a lot of contacts in the contest and really be competitive, you might want to think about trying to call CQ and running if your station can handle it. In a contest contact, in addition to each station's call sign, the operators also send extra information called the exchange, which you talked about earlier. The exchange provides a piece or pieces of information about the station being contacted. Different contacts use different type of exchanges. So in this example, uh, I give my exchanger 5-9 in Ohio and Bob in Utah says 5-9 in Utah. So the, there the exchange was obviously our state, our section. 
I already mentioned these the different types of exchanges. Uh, finding your grid square, I have links for that. Grid squares start in the southwest and run northeast. So they go from AA all the way to RR. Most of the ones in the US and Canada start with either a C, a D, or an E, or an F. Uh, so that's the, the grid squares. And each of these then have subgrid squares. And then each of those subgrid squares have subdivisions. So you can actually have eight digits. Most of the time, for co major contests, you're using the four digits. So my grid square would be Echo November 91. Uh, but my subgrid square is Echo November 91 HE, Hotel Echo. As I mentioned earlier, you can click on this link to get to that page that I showed with all the charts and maps in it. I also have uh, more information on exchanges and maps on my website. So here's a typical contest exchange. Station A, CQ, CQ, CQ contest, Kilo 3, Lima Radio. And I, Station B answers Kilo 8, Zulu Tango. And Station uh, K3LR goes K8ZT, you're 599, actually be 59, this is a phone contest. Tim in Pennsylvania, 59 Owl, Ohio. Thank you, QRZ, and they give their call sign. So that's why they would do it. And again, that's just a mistype on there. They'd say 599. On CW, it's even slimmed down more. CQ test, K3LR. I send my call sign K8ZT. They respond with K8ZT 5NN. The Ns are used as cut digits, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes to mean nines. Tim, PA, 59, 5NN, AL, Ohio, TU, thank you, QRZ, K3LR. So notice nothing superfluous. No copy my call sign. Your exchange is, we're just given the basic information. When you give that information, it's important to give it in what's the, called the accepted order of elements of the exchange. So there's some reasons for this. It's by tradition. Sometimes it's for clarity. Sometimes that's the way we always do it. But the people on the other end will be expecting you to give your exchange, especially if it's a complex exchange, in a very specific order. Your best bet is to listen to the way the stations are doing it and then mimic them. It makes it easier for the station to copy because they know what to expect. And here we have a little example. Uh, this gentleman here is uh, sending in CW, and he's in the uh, the uh, AW World sweepstakes, and he sends his exchange of 5NN, 599, his serial number, 2315. That means he's this is the, the 2,315 station he worked. B, that's his category of his power of his station. WB3QFG, you have to give your call sign to get in the exchange in this particular contest. The check uh, digits, which is the year he was licensed, 14, and then his AWRL section, which is WPA. And the young lady goes, Roger, Roger, thank you. She got everything because she was able, getting it in the order she expected. Here, the gentleman sends it in a different order. He sends 599, then he sends his call sign, then he sends his category. Then he sends his serial number. Then he sends WPA 14. And she goes again because she wasn't expecting in that order. So sending it in the expected accepted order is very important, especially for complex exchanges like the um, sweepstakes. Make sure you use the correct abbreviation for counties and states. Don't use three-letter abbreviations when there's a, actually a valid two-letter abbreviation. Uh, make sure you're using the right one. Don't confuse Oregon and Orange County, they have different abbreviations and they're different places. On phone, use phonetics as necessary so they make sure they get the information. Now the question always is, once you give the exchange, did they copy me? So what I did is put together a little chart here uh, to decide whether they copied you or not. So the first thing is, if they didn't copy you, this is what they'll typically do. They might send a question mark on CW or a couple question marks. <laughs> they might ask you for your call sign. That means they don't have your call. Uh, they might go again or repeat. Again on phone, they'd say again or repeat. On CW, they'd abbreviate it. That means they didn't get it all and they want you to repeat everything. If they send something like NR question mark or number with a question, that means that they're missing a serial number typically, or it might be a zone number or something like that. 
if they send any other part of the exchange, like the exchange, that means they need the whole thing. But if they send section, uh, that means they just want the section. So try and just give them the part they're asking for so that there's not confusion. So they're missing part of your exchange is basically the message here, and you need to give them that part. If they send a B4 or dupe, that means they think they've worked you before. Now, if you they did not work you, you need to do something about that. If they did work you already, uh, then you just move on and go find someone else. Using computer logging means it's very unlikely that you're going to work duplicate stations because you'll know before you try and work them. So typically when someone says before dupe, they might have copied someone else's call wrong or they copied yours wrong. So, for example, maybe they thought it was I was K8GT uh, uh, and they thought they already worked me. We often get our calls mixed up. So I check my log real quick and I know that I didn't work them. So I'd say, no, I'm not a dupe. I'm Kilo 8 Zulu Tango and uh, they hopefully get my call right this time and we work and we're done. If they send an NIL or say not in the log, that means they did not copy you. Don't log the re don't log the contact, it's not valid. That means no, I didn't work you. If they send later or sorry, that means no contact also. And they mean try later, not a few seconds later, a few minutes or maybe even a half an hour later. And you know, write down the frequency and make a note for yourself and then try it a little bit later band conditions might change if they did copy you hopefully they'll send something like tu or say thank you on phone or r or an rr or they'll say roger they might say they might send a qsl they might send a 73 they might say okay yes or any other affirmative like i got it or whatever they if they're not having a problem at all and everything seems to be going smoothly and they just start calling cq afterward that means they probably got you and they're going to move on and, and continue uh it's it's very convenient to, so i would suggest if you're the station that's that, that they're answering send a thank you or a roger or something so that people know that you they that you got all their information now the problem comes in when you're not really sure if the station received your exchange if the CQing station is having problems with your call and or exchange, consider repeating it twice, but don't get carried away with endless repeating. If they're having trouble on phone uh, and they're messing up your phonetics, consider alternative phonetics for the missed letters. So if a station mistakes my Kilo 8 Zulu Tango, the Zulu they think is a zero, I might use my alternative phonetics, which I use as Kilo 8 Zanzibar Tokyo. I don't use that typically because it's not standard phonetics, but if they're having trouble with that Zulu and they're confusing it with zero, I want to make sure I break that that mistake in their mind there. Excessive use of sending double call signs, exchanges in good conditions can frustrate other stations and greatly slow things down. So only use, use repet, repetition when necessary. On phone, good operators can add a cadence and pitch to the voicing of the exchange that clarifies different portions of the exchange and enha can enhance the ability to copy it. On CW, proper spacing and clean sending is very important. If the station repeats back to you your exchange with a question mark, or the, on phone they have a questioning tone, then you need to confirm it. They might also say, please confirm on phone. So if they gave you back the information and it was correct confirm that it was correct send a quick r r r on cw or give them a roger or qsl on phone that means that they got everything right that means they'll move on you move on everything was great if they send your exchange back to you and it was wrong make sure you send no negative or say negative and then correct them on it give the correct exchange and make sure they get it before you move on if the station is not successful in getting your exchange after multiple tries, they may send later, Neil, sorry, etc. That means that it's not going to work out now, so try it later uh, and don't keep calling on the frequency. Now, you read through all the rules and you knew what the exchange is going to be, and then you start actually hearing people in the contest and it's much different than you thought it was going to be. This is what I call the secret language of the exchange. So it's a couple different possibilities. The first one is the accepted order may not be the same way it's shown in the rules. So you hear everyone sending it a specific way. That's the way you want to send it also. So we talked about the accepted order a little bit earlier. No matter what it says in the rules, find out how people are doing it in the contest and then mimic what they're doing because that's the accepted order. 
on phone on on CW sometimes operators use use cut numbers and we'll talk about those in a few seconds and then the third one is really bad that's unintentional cut numbers that's when they actually send sloppy CW and they're trying to send numbers but they're not really sending numbers and then again the confirmations and repeats so let's talk about cut numbers over the years hams have attempted to shorten and simplify code to make it faster easier to send cut numbers are an attempt to do this sometimes this works other times it may not the most common cut numbers are using the letter n for the number for the digit nine so five nine nine would be sent as five n n so what are they saving they're saving three dashes every time they send an n instead of a nine so instead of dash 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 dot they're sending da dit so they're saving those extra da's and it's much quicker there are cut numbers available for eight of the ten digits of zero through i'm sorry one through ten but only three of them are more co are most commonly used the most common ones are t for zero n for nine and a for one Sometimes people will send a one as an A. Sometimes they'll send a 100 as an ATT. They'll send a 1000 as a K. They'll send a five as an E. This is a fairly recent event. I've not noticed this until about three years ago. People start sending exchanges instead of five N N, they're sending E N N. So dit dot it dot it is what they're sending. Also, sometimes people will mix both cut letters and regular letters in the same exchange if you operate the cw sprints on wednesday uh, cw ops uh, test on wednesdays quite a, the exchange is a member number and a lot of the people mix both digits and cut letters in there so they might send for example uh four a n t for four thousand one hundred and uh i forget what i said zero um, in there so sometimes it'll mix them together it can be taken to extreme where it becomes very confusing if you're not comfortable with sending cut letters cut numbers you don't have to send them but you do need to be able to recognize some of them or you're going to be very confused by people now the unintentional cut numbers and other unintelligible unintelligible exchanges on CW and sometimes on phone, but we're talking about CW here, is when they go to send the five and they drop one of the dits, so it now becomes an H. Or they go to send the two and they drop one of the dits and it now becomes a J. These are caused by either sloppy sending or a excessive time that it takes them to, their amp uh, relays to kick in, so they're actually chopping their letters up. This could be very uh, confusing sometimes. Also, some people will run all their digits, all their elements together in the the numbers, and you don't know where one stops and another one begins. So it can be very confusing with call signs also. So um, you can practice more with that later if you're into CW contesting. Let's move on now to things that each station should typically do in a contact. The calling station should give their call sign frequently so the people aren't asking them for their call sign. Uh, they give the call complete call sign of the station they're replying to, or they give part of it and ask for a repeat. So if the station copies me, they might say Kilo 8 Zulu Tango, or if they're only getting part of my call, they might say the Zulu Tango station or the K8 station. Uh, they need to give the exchange. They then need to acknowledge the reception of the exchange. That's where they give that little thank you or an R or ask for a repeat, and then they log the contact. Answering stations, on the other hand, should tune on to the calling station's listening frequency, not their calling frequency, but where they're responding to people. It might not be split, but it might be a little bit higher or lower in frequency. They need to give their call sign phonetically if it's a phone contact. Answer only when called, correcting any problems with the call sign. Don't answer if they're calling someone else. Know and give the exchange and then log the contact. So what's next after your first contact? Continue to make additional contacts. Some contacts act as multipliers. In other words, you get more points by working them. So the way it works is the total number of points you get from the sum of your contacts is multiplied by the sum of multipliers to give a final score. So if it's the United States, for example, is the multiplier, that means you have 50 possible multipliers. 
uh, that you can you can get. So if you work 150 stations and you work 30 states, you would then multiply it according to the rules and you probably end up with something like 4,500 points in the contest. So the motto is go forth and not multiply, but work more multipliers. So one contact can actually mean multiple points. Different contests have different types of multipliers. Some use counties, some use states, some use countries, some use zones, uh, some use both. So the CQ Worldwide uses both the DX country and the zone. So you get you can get a double multiplier. The way different contests count multipliers, though, is different. Different contests count multipliers differently. Some of them count the money once per contest. Some count once per band. And some also count once per band and or mode if it's a multiple mode contest. So for example, if the contest is a both phone NCW contest and the multiplier is states. I can work uh, each time I work that state on a different band or a different mode, I get a multiplier. Now, some of the contests, once you work that multiplier on one band, you're done. You don't get more multiplier credit. Oh, basically, let me just mention also some contests only allow you to work a station on one band, even though they're multiple band stations. So once you've worked a station on any band, you can't work them on other bands. But that's not typically the case, but there are a few contests that way. So some tips for newer contesters. Make sure you read and understand the contest rules. Know the exchange beforehand. Know the CQing station's call sign before responding to them. Listen for a while. Especially if it's CW and you're not real great at CW, you have plenty of time to listen because they'll send their call sign over and over and over again. Contest QSOs should be kept streamlined. Send only what is required in the exchange. Avoid excessive information. Repeat only requested information. I have a whole presentation on how to make contacts during contest and, and any time actually. And it's called how to make that cue. So get in the rhythm, know the rhyme and dance the dance. And that's available at this link, tiny.cc slash r dash r dash d. And you can get this presentation uh, and go through. I actually did this presentation for the QSO Today Expo. So if you were there, you can watch the recording. And that'll probably also become available to the general public after the first 30 days. So after the contest is over, uh, most contests require that or prefer electronic submission of logs. Most are submitted by an online file uploader or via an email attachment. For details and deadlines, see each contest rules. Some contest deadlines are less than a week away, some are a month away. Nothing worse than having a great score in the contest and not having your log get in in time. So make sure you check that. The usual required format that you upload is called a Cabrillo file. And fortunately, most contesting software will easily produce this file for you by a couple clicks. Now, there's two main types of files produced by contesting software. The Cabrillo file, which has an extension of .log or log, and then the ADIF file, which is a file that you use for importing into other programs has an exchange of dot I mean, i'm sorry an extension of dot adi or dot adif that's not the file they want they want the dot log file or the cabrillo file if you don't have uh, a program to create the cabrillo file there are some websites out there and there are also some uh, forms that will let you create a cabrillo file from your paper log some suggested post contest routine. This is my routine. You can uh, choose to adopt it if you'd like. I, first thing I do is generate my Cabrillo file so it's ready to send out. I then generate my ADIF file so I can import from my contest log into my general log, which are I keep all my contacts. I then enter my information on the 3830 rumor site. Uh, that's the site I mentioned earlier where people post the rumors of their scores. Um, you don't have to do that. It doesn't enter you in the contest. It's just a fun thing to do. I then also make sure I upload my logs for uh, QSLing to both Logbook of the World and EQSL. I also upload my uh, ADIF file to Club Log. And then I make sure I back up all my logging files to online storage, such as Google Drive or OneDrive, so that if I need to get back to that file at a later time and something happens to my computer, I can get to it. Uh, I have a bunch of information on Logbook of the World and uh, EQSL. I actually did a presentation called QSLing in an online world. I've done that multiple times. 
Now, contest results typically come out um, a couple months after the contest. There's the time for the deadline for submission, and then after submission, the logs have to be gone through and the scores have to be compiled. And most of them that are printed in magazines have to then wait another three months after that point for the magazine to come out. So it can be multiple months. So right now we're still waiting for the June field day results to come out in uh, QST. They probably won't come out for another month. So in the meantime, there's a couple things you can do. The first thing you can do is you can participate during the contest in real time online contest scoreboards and there's a number of them and there's more information here i'm not going to go through all that in detail here's just an example of what they look like uh, and your information gets posted it's sort of fun to look at it you can also after the contest post your scores to the 38 rumors uh, site and that'll be a great place and there's a whole presentation on that available here's some more information on it i did a slideshow on it uh, tiny.cc slash 3830. Here's what it looks like. You pick the contest, you put in your information, then you can go back and look and see how you did compared to other people. Now, contest awards. Unfortunately, winning even the largest contest doesn't result in big money awards. In fact, there's no money awards involved. Awards are usually limited to a trophy or a plaque for the first places and certificates for other accomplish accomplishments. Although some contests, some of the Q state QSO parties have fun little uh, small prizes so i won a small one ounce bottle of maple syrup by by finishing first in my category in the vermont qso party i have a number of contesting resources available the first one is i helped design a class called introduction to amateur radio contesting it's available in the aaa learning center it's five modules you can go through that class but you do need to be an aaa member uh, when you're all done, when you get to print out this nice little leather bound PDF file, you have to provide the leather on your own. I provide the PDF file. Uh, there's a book that came out a few years ago by Doug Grant, K1DG. It's a very good book. It's called Amateur Radio Contesting for Beginners. There's also extra reading material for you to sign up for. Uh, there's a weekly AWRL contest update. And you can sign up to get that in your email. There's also a contesting.com ham radio mailing list where you can discuss contesting with your fellow contesters. The AWRL online group, uh, AWRL contesting. And then there's also a Facebook group, contesting and DXing, that you might want to consider joining. Uh, the, RG, RG8, the RSGB has a contest guide available, uh, a beginner's guide to HF contesting, and some other information. This slide's in here because I did the presentation for the Norfolk England group a couple weeks ago. Here's some contest resources, mainly videos. Uh, ND3N has a uh, thing on why you contest, how you contest. There's one in here from the YouTuber bunch, Dave Kassler uh, video. Uh, must I submit a log if I make contacts? This is a very good video. And the answer is no, you don't have to. The other person won't get dinged for you not submitting a log, but uh, you might want to submit one. A great resource is Contest University. If you get a chance to attend in person, it's usually held on the Thursday before Dayton. But the great thing is if you go up here and go to the files section of the website, they have video recordings of, oh, come on, of video recordings of the presentations that you can watch for free. So even if you didn't get a chance to attend in person, you can go back and watch all the video recordings all the way back to 2014. 2014, there's no recordings. There's just a book. I have one on the shelf here. Uh, the PDFs, but uh, this is a great resource uh, for becoming more in, uh, more uh, astute in contesting. There's also, uh, you might want to join a contesting club, and I have a link here that has contesting clubs around the world that you can uh, think about signing up for. And the neat thing is you probably want to pick one close to you so you can be in their competitive circle. Some contest only law club members to submit if they're within a certain number of mile circle and i actually belong to two groups i belong to the north coast contesters group and the mad river uh, uh, radio club which are two contesting clubs in my area i have a bunch of stuff on my contesting web page and again uh, that's the end if you want to get all the slides all this information from the slides the slideshow is available at tiny.cc slash ar contest We'll also post the PDF to this on the Rat Pack site so you can get it there also, or you can scan the QR code and I'll leave that up there for a few minutes. Um, I'll come back to that slide in a second. 
This is my contact information, KHZT at AWRL.net, my website. I also have a list of all my presentations, including tonight's presentation and recorded versions of many of them. If your local club is interested in the presentation, I'm more than happy to give one. Just go to tiny.cc slash kzt p and you'll get the full list of all my presentations uh, for a variety of subjects, including the slideshows. And if there's a recorded video you can watch, you can take a look at that. So again, let me go back to the slide with the questions and the QR code. So let's check and see whether we have any questions in the um, So Barry um, was at the, uh, the 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 World Series with the Boston Red Sox and the St. Louis uh, um, Cardinals. Thank you, Cardinals. Boy, my mind went blank there. I remember that series very well because we got to watch it in school, and I really I had a friend who was a Boston Red Sox fan, and I was a Cardinals fan, so we had a great time with that. Uh, let's see any other things in the class. Anthony, will will a running station work split? Typically, they don't. Um, it's considered it's 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 considered sort of like bad um, bad etiquette to work split in a contest unless you're some really rare DX station. Um, so most of the time, no, they won't. But occasionally, you will see stations running split if they're a really rare station and they're on the air during a contest. What typically happens with rare DX during contest? Very very rare. If they're not interested in getting in the contest, they will often move and spend the time during the contest on the work bands or on the alternative mode. So if it's a big phone contest weekend, a lot of times the DX stations will go down and work CW during that time period. So think about that. If you're, if that's another advantage of contesting that is not a competitive aspect, if there's a contest going on and there's a rare DX station on that's not operating in the contest, check out the work bands and check out the alternative mode to see if that's where they're at. Let me go ahead and stop my screen share here. And I will go ahead and answer any questions. If you want to raise your hand, Dan will acknowledge you. And Barry will be checking the chat, as usual, I'm guessing. Uh, yes. Martin uh, says he really likes field day. I do too, Martin. My wife and I travel to a different location typically each year. So we, uh, I need to know my grid score and my county and everything when I get there. So in case I need to exchange that also. Uh, Chris Lance asks, can you recommend any non- proprietary log checking programs for clubs that want to host a contest and need to analyze the results. I am not really able to do that, Lance, but what I would do is I would get in touch with one of the people from the major contest and ask them what they can suggest. Uh, K1AR, uh, K1DG are two people that are involved. K5ZD, these are all people that are involved quite a bit in contesting and contest log checking. There's a whole infrastructure behind this that a number of people support that are really unsung heroes of contesting. Bruce Horn's contest calendar website and his 3830 site are really integral. Bruce also does a number of smaller contests. He actually hosts the place where people submit their scores through 3830 for that. Um, the gentleman that did all the Cabrillo file work, uh, K5RO, uh, I think it is. I'm going to get it wrong mess it up uh, so no I can't so uh, questions just a quick comment if you're going to contest you have to be a little bit patient especially if you're not running a kilowatt with a beam because some of those stations are impossible to break if you're running QRP or even 100 watts and they'll step right on over you and completely ignore you so it needs a lot of patience and a lot of, op of operating skill and you'll and, eventually you'll succeed. And one of the things I'll add to that, because I'm I'm the five watt operator all the time, it really makes you learn about propagation, so you know what band to jump on at the right time and what times to be switching bands and things like that. So there's a whole strategy to searching and pouncing that's a little bit different than uh, the brute force of being a running station. Uh, Anthony, when you get a chance, you might put put the in the chat your. Uh, that URL to get to get your uh, slideshow tonight. Yes, I will. And that will give everybody a chance to go buy stuff down the night as well as normal way. Okay, there it and is. And there are now. also the, the old man contests that they have every week. We constantly, whether you're, you're an old man or you're a teenager, 
And those are a lot of fun because those are very low stress contests. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of contests that are that are very they're much less stress. The stay QSO parties are a good place to start. Also, I think I put that second one in there wrong. Uh, no, I got it. I put in the link for tonight and also the link for um, the uh, my whole website of all my list of all my sites. Um, the, the all the Rat Pack uh, sessions. There's a question about will this be available? All the Rat Pack sessions are recorded. We'll post this recording tomorrow. Uh, sometime is well, Dan will get it to me and I'll put it up and it'll be available. And if you're not familiar with the Rat Pack list at h at tiny.cc Rat Pack, sorry, tiny.cc slash Rat Pack dash list. And I'll put that in the chat here. That's where all of our things are at. I'll bring, I'm going to actually bring this up and show the screen share real quick. Okay, let's see if I can do this. There we go. So this is uh, the list that we have, and it shows the upcoming sessions. They'll be in red. The dates will be in red for sessions upcoming. You can click on that link to get the Zoom link. And then we also have all the recorded sessions, and they go back all the way to April of 2020. So there are now over, uh, as of tonight, there is over 230 recorded sessions available for you and we're happy if you want to use these for your local club you can download the video and play it at your local club or play it from youtube we have no problems with you doing that um we also keep all the documents and video information also we have a twitter page uh, a twitter site so you can follow us on twitter and you can also follow us on facebook if you go to our website which is ratpack.us You'll find all the links, including the email groups that you can gr join the groups IO. Uh, you can find the Rat Pack YouTube uh, page. You can become a subscriber. Uh, you can go to the Rat Pack Twitter, or you can also go to the Rat Pack Facebook page. So again, ratpack.us is the link for the website. I'm glad to see some new faces out. I hope maybe that some of you saw some of my posts either on Facebook or on Twitter this week. Uh, questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer any questions in person. Comments, complaints. Were you going Dan's to... in charge of complaints. <laughs> Were you going to put that URL for uh, getting obtaining this? Uh... Yes, I put it in there already. Oh, you know what? All my all my messages I just went went to John only. So let me fix this. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay, I just sent out I chat. just sent out four things to John. John. Got all the messages instead of everyone else. Let me get all these sent out to everyone here. Okay, there they are. All three of them are now out to the group instead of just the John. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And and these will be in the chat recording. In the recording yes. when we when they're posted. Yeah, and you can get those from the documents link on the uh, Red Pack list site there. All right. We very much encourage you, if you like to, is put a link to our stuff on your websites or your Facebooks or however, so your members and clubs will have access to these things. Um, lots of good videos and lots of good subjects, a lot of qualified speakers. Um, make it available. Make it available to, that's what it's for. Free of charge, go for it. I just want to show you real quick. I still have the share up, I think. Okay. We are going to be having a special series coming up in October. Um, De Dennis Kidder, W8, I'm sorry, that's W6. I got to fix that. W6 DQ, boy, he's going to, he, I, he got an eight in his call sign. <laughs> he and I will be starting a series October 12th, October 19th, and October 26th. We're going to be doing three weeks. It's a beginner's guide to HF on those days. Again, that's October uh, 12th. 19th and 26th three weeks beginner guide to hf the first week we're going to talk about the hf bands making hf contacts the second week we're going to focus on antennas and radios and the third week on setting it all up and operating and contesting so again those will all be available and it, we also did a special series it was myself again but this time it was marty uh wool n6vi back in july we did a three-part series um on Beginner's Guide to VHF and UHF on July 6th, 13th, and 
20th. And you can watch the videos for any of those uh, for information on getting started on VHF and UHF. And then I also mentioned earlier that I have a class uh, coming up. So if you're looking to get your technician class license, I'm working with a group, a local group. We do it online. It's free. It's live. It starts October 9th. And I'll put the link for that up here also. John's going to think you don't love him anymore. Yes, I got to. I got to make sure this this is going to go out to the wrong person unless I change it real quick here because I hate the way the Zoom does that. But okay, and if you're an AWR member, take a look at the Learning Center. Take a look at the class I put together. I I put that together about two years ago. And it's five modules you can work your way through and all the resources are in there. Talk a lot more detail about the things I talked about tonight. Okay, looking for hands up for more questions and comments. Let's put it in the chat. Anthony, it's Mark from uh, just north of Peterborough, Ontario. Yes. I'm, also, I'm also a QRP contester, and a couple of times I've ran across where a kilowatt station actually set about 10 minutes of, of an hour uh, um, aside, strictly wanting to work QRP. And that's how I worked uh, Hawaii once. That's how I worked Japan. It was it was really nice to, uh, to see a kilowatt say, all I want to hear QRP. Now, you know, they, they do all the work on that side, on the receiving side, but in a couple contests, they get a benefit for it. There's a contest in December on 160 called the Stu Perry Contest. And the way that works is the points you get are multiplied if you work QRP stations. So it's based on distance away, and then, it's, then they can also get a multiplier for working a QRP station. And actually, during a contest a little bit later in the year, I had an NP2 stop during the exchange and thank me for my contact in the Stu Perry contest because he got the distance from Ohio to, to uh, Virgin Islands, which was very good. But then he also got a 20 times multiplier for me being QRP. So he uh, thanked me for that, which is atypical to have the running station stop and thank you for a contact in another contest. If you ever doubt the power of QRP, go QRP during major co uh, contests or events such as Field Day, that's a good one. You're sitting there with three, five watts, whatever. And it's amazing the people that will call you, get to you, and this kind of stuff. But next day after the contest, oh, nobody hears you now. <laughs> yes, I'm much more popular during contests. I operate all five watts here, and I'm just going to turn uh, the 105,000 QSO mark in the next week or two. Yeah. And this will be contest season coming up, so hopefully I'll be up maybe close to 110,000 by the end of the year if I'm really lucky, or at least 107,000. Other com comments, questions? I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Tomorrow night, we have a very good presentation. On Thursday nights, Rat Pack has emergency communications based uh, topics. And tomorrow night, Diana and Barry will be doing a introduction to all the various forms you can use for emergency comm. Uh, so it'll be a very instructive one again tomorrow night. And then we have a number of other uh, sessions coming up over the next couple of weeks. When I sent out the invites that I sent out the email, I put down at the bottom of that thing, four weeks in advance, four weeks scheduled events. So you can just take a quick look, print it out, whatever, and see what's going on for the next four weeks. Yeah, and if you subscribe to any of the, the the dot io uh, group the group io uh, mailing list on our website you will get an email from dan each week with the information so again the website is rat pack r-a-t-p-a-c dot u-s okay well we move over the hour here good timing um are there any comments out there just random anything you want to say out there Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.